Shoutouts to some holiday movie fans, Josh from St. Mary's, Pennsylvania, and Sarah from Mansfield, Ohio. This episode is just one of several this year where we'll mark the holidays. Today's episode is one of two this week that we'll be talking about one of the most watched holiday classics, National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. Consider this National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation Week at the Shaping Opinion Podcast. Later this week, we'll talk to one of the ensemble cast members who appeared in the movie that's now 30 years old. But today, we'll be talking to the movie's director, Jeremiah Chechik. If you have any thoughts or feedback, send them to me through email at tim at shapingopinion.com. If it's easier for you, get in touch with us on Twitter or Instagram at Shaping Opinion. If you want, we can give you a shout out. As always, thank you for being a listener of the Shaping Opinion podcast. You're the reason we do this. This is Shaping Opinion, a production of O'Brien Communications. Do you have a favorite quote from a character in the film? Uh, There's a few that come to mind. Best to let them finish. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Shitter's Full, of course, is always a a good one. That's quoted to me back through pretty much everybody I know Mm -hmm. uh, and meet. Uh, Those are, uh, I guess if I had a, a favorite... Uh, There are so many obscure ones. Uh, I would have to go through the entire script in my head. And, you know, note, I don't really watch my movies after I've done them, though I have seen this one uh, occasionally when they've screened it and had a QA and a and that kind of stuff when I was able to sit in the audience and uh, pretty much enjoy it as objectively as any director could. Your favorite quote, then, is when Cousin Eddie says to Clark Griswold, best to let him finish. And he goes... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> I think it's the that I liked what Randy was doing when he taps his head and says got a plate in my head something like that I'm Tim O'Brien. In this episode of the Shaping Opinion Podcast, we're joined by Jeremiah Chechik. He's the director of many films, particularly the one we'll be talking about today, which is National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. The premise of our podcast is simple. We talk about people, events, and things that have shaped the way we think. Today, we'll talk with Jeremiah about the holiday classic he directed, what it was like behind the scenes, and why National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation is as popular as ever 30 years later. Are there any movies you just have to watch every year during the holiday season? Maybe you like to watch Frank Caffer's classic called It's a Wonderful Life that featured Jimmy Stewart. Or perhaps your favorite movie is one of the Home Alone films, written of course by John Hughes. Or just maybe your holiday season wouldn't be complete without inviting Clark Griswold and family into your home. Is the season to be jolly? Fa la 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 la. After vacationing across America and throughout Europe, take it, Russ. This holiday season, the Griswolds are going to play it safe. Clark, we're stuck under a truck. It's been 30 years since John Hughes wrote the script for National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation and it hit the screens in 1989. The film was based on a short story that John Hughes wrote for National Lampoon in December of 1980. The story was called Christmas 59. The movie was no small budget affair and it featured an ensemble cast of already established actors and a few who would become A-list Hollywood stars. In addition to Chevy Chase, who played Clark Griswold, Beverly D'Angelo played Clark's wife, Ellen. Juliette Lewis played their sarcastic teenage daughter. A young Johnny Galecki played their son, Russ. Randy Quaid delivered an unforgettable performance as Cousin Eddie, and he was joined by an all-star ensemble cast that included Miriam Flynn, who played his wife, Catherine. John Randolph, Diane Ladd, E.G. Marshall, and Doris Roberts played the parents of Clark and Ellen. Other notable actors who made their mark on the film were William Hickey, Mae Questel, Julia Louis-Dreyfus, and Brian Doyle Murray. Christmas Vacation debuted at number two at the box office, grossing nearly $12 million that opening weekend. 
It would top the box office charts three weeks later, eventually grossing over $71 million in the United States. And that was before it hit the home video market and landed its place on our list of holiday season traditions. For Jeremiah Chechik, it was his first chance to direct a full-length feature film in comedy. Well, obviously, to make that script, which uh, was a fantastically written piece of work, fundamentally the story of, uh, of unintended consequences when someone who, in trying to do good, <laughs> basically kills it for everybody else. And so it was a very, very good theme. I wanted to make a, a film that, you know, was true to the script. And, and note that up at that app, I never really saw myself as anyone who would kind of have any kind of, of career or success doing comedy. My work up to that point, whether it was, you know, for commercials or just in my personal taste, uh, I really liked dark, brooding, noir, which I still do, and much more kind of nuanced drama. And so when I was offered this, and I thought it was a kind of an unusual ask, but hell, you know, before I did it in, in the in the prep, I, I really wanted to study the work of directors like Billy Wilder and, and, and Preston Sturges and Howard Hawks, uh, you know, and Leo McCrary, these geniuses, uh, you know, my DGA forefathers who, who, A, they were brilliant at being able to swap genres at will. I mean, you could do a war film one day, you could do a broad comedy the next and a very nuanced drama following month. And, and I, I, I just I, I was in awe of those guys uh, in terms of how they managed the the quality of their work, how they told stories, etc. And so, I I watched a lot of their work to try and put me in a zone wherein I could answer the question: What is it about the movies that they made? You know, from the '30s moving forward into the 40s, etc., that lasted. You know, you could watch these movies today. They're still funny. They're still visual. They're still uh, engaging. And rather than just make a programmer, which I believe that Warner's really was just expecting, I wanted to understand what is it that makes a movie timeless? Now, this is going to sound like a lot of bullshit because... You know, the, the movie, you know, years later has become somewhat of a classic. And I say this objectively, you know, it's not something that I invented. Uh, people are telling me that. So, but I, my intention was to try and make a film that transcended its, you know, time and location that would be able to be enjoyed years from when I made it. And, and so, so many of the choices that I made aesthetically were in the Courier and Ives and very, very classic Americana imagery and, and the way I attempted to tailor the wardrobe and, and just uh, stage to not be hip. And, you know, coming out of commercials where your, you know, your lifeblood is being on the cutting edge of visuals and hipness and all of that stuff to arrest the eyeballs of, of so many people watching, I, I felt I had to pull back a kind of more extreme visual language into a much more classic, timeless, um, painterly, if you will, aesthetic. And so a lot of my thinking was along those lines to try and, and, and make the thing last longer than me. And one thing I know is you never saw the other two vacation films that this followed. And I'm, did that help you come up with an original look and feel to this picture? Well, I, I can't say because I didn't see it. But, and I didn't do it out of any kind of disrespect for the, for the movies that came. I just thought I did not want to create a film based on someone else's ideologies. And, and uh, whether it was the studio or, or the producers or, or, or the directors that came before, I wanted to do my own thing. If this was an original movie without kind of the Chevy Chase vacation moniker, I think it would, it would, be, it would be effectively the same movie with 
you know, different cast, but because the story was the same. So trying not to think about, well, I'm making a, you know, the third sequel. I don't want to be influenced by either the first successful movie or the second one that was kind of on the edge of success, I guess. Uh, I just wanted to do my own thing. I wanted to approach it as an original movie uh, told through my eyes as a kind of a budding director and just see what would happen. And and so that, that was my approach. Let's talk a little bit about your background before getting into some more discussion about the movie. And that is, you said you were a fashion photographer Vogue and you had done commercials and some of your commercials had become iconic. That's what I read. And they caught the attention of Stanley Kubrick, who liked them and mentioned them in, an, in a New York Times article. And that's when things changed for you. How did that change? Well, I'd been doing, oh God, I think it was the Michelob commercials. You know, the night belongs to the Michelob. Like one of them had Genesis in it. Tonight, tonight, tonight. Anyway, it's going back a while. But it turns out that I had done this, these commercials and, and was flying from L.A. to New York or vice versa. And I'd read that Kubrick had in an interview for for a film uh, he, that he was promoting, uh, had said that he had seen these commercials on tape that people would send him. Uh, and people would send him tape because he was a big football fan and he was living in London. And so he would watch these a couple of days later or a day later. And he had just mentioned it in passing. And I went, oh, my God, <laughs> I did that commercial. Uh, and, and uh, you know, curiously and not long after, I got a call from um, Spielberg's office and they invited me in to talk about what it is I wanted to do. So that that's really that was my first intro to Hollywood. And that's that's how I started to work with Amblin for a while and then Warners and then on and on. And one thing led to another, and it wouldn't be long before you were looking at scripts, and you said that the Warner Brothers had sent you scripts, and one of the scripts was Christmas Vacation. What was it about that script that you liked that drew you to that movie? You know, to, to kind of back up a bit, when the film that I was developing did not move forward, at least at that moment, it eventually moved forward, but I was like, I don't know, I was, I was kind of disappointed in one night that I wasn't going to be able to make the movie, but it wasn't altogether that surprising. It was a kind of a more experimental film and it was at a studio and, 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 but I guess the point is that I didn't really understand how it worked, the business anyway. And, and Warner started sending me scripts and they, they had sent me many, many, many scripts. And I thought, well, you know, um, I get along with them. They're probably just kind of creating a good relationship with me, maybe keep me in their back pocket do something later. And I mean, you know, like one of them, they said, oh yeah, this is a movie. You should look at this. Clint Eastwood is doing it. And, and, uh, we think he'd be really good for it. And I was Clint Eastwood. That's so great. Oh my God. Then I read the script and I remember calling my agent and I said, there's no way in hell that Clint Eastwood is going to be doing a movie called pink Cadillac. I mean, that's <laughs> never going to happen. This is like terrible. Uh, Sooner than later, I realized, you know, th they were sending me all the movies that they intended to make. And one of them was Christmas Vacation. I read this script and this was a really funny script. And often, you know, in comedy, at least the way I look at it, the comedic value really happens in the setup to the actual gag where you just kind of set it up, set it up, set it up. And the payoff is just the kind of release of the audience through laughter of uh, being able to create that in many ways, the dramatic tension of the moment and John script just had, it was just full of it. And so I, I, I remember the experience of reading it. And, and I always say you can only read a script for the first time once. And so you really want to be very wide awake and very open because it could change your life. And I read this and I just I just thought it was fantastic. And so I, I phoned, I said, I'd do this. I don't know anything about comedy, but <laughs> if, if it makes me laugh, maybe I'll make one other person laugh. Uh, yeah. 
Well, you saw a great script, and at the core of any good script is a story. And you had mentioned that the first scene you filmed was the first scene in the picture where Chevy Chase and his family are driving on a highway getting their uh, Christmas tree. Can you describe that first day? Everything's shot out of sequence. All the stuff that was in the car and the stuff marching through the snow, that all happened, you know, weeks and sometimes months later. I think the kids in the car, when they were having that kind of opening, the intercuts, happened at the very end of the movie. But because we did that with all kinds of uh, process shots on stage uh, at the studio. Mainly we did the stunts and the driving stuff the first day. That's what I what I remember. And and the you know the the car leaping off the snowbank into the uh, parking lot of the uh, tree farm. Uh, that was my first day, and I, you know it was good because there wasn't any performance of you know no performance. It was pretty much a mechanical process. And you know coming from commercials, your technical abilities are pretty sharp, you know, for most, most commercial directors. So, so there was nothing unusual or frightening about it. I think the only real difference for me was the pace of work. You know, in commercials, you could spend all day doing one shot or two. You know, here we had, you know, we had multiple setups and but I, again, I was comfortable in how much work I had to do. I liked my crew. And the first day, outside of the weather issues, was a very mechanical day for me and one that, that I felt very comfortable. Whose idea was it to do that opening scene where the car gets trapped underneath a logging truck? Oh, that was, that was in the script. There are so many funny scenes in the movie. Each scene is almost its own little bit. Is there a favorite scene for you that you liked directing? Yes, there is. I think my favorite scene uh, to direct, and it is one of my favorite scenes in the movie now still, is the scene where uh, Chevy has gone up to the attic. He is trapped in the attic. He is cold. He puts on all kinds of crazy clothes that he finds up there, and he finds an old projector, and he starts looking at old home movies. I love doing that scene. I love what we were able to kind of create, him and I, in terms of a mood and a tone. It was not comedic. It, it was just touching. And, of course, it pays off with the intercut of the family coming home and the pull down of the stairs and him dropping through as the payoff. But, <laughs> you know, the music was very much pre pre-selected by me. I, I really wanted that song. That, that again, was a War Ray Charles song. Yeah. And, and Warner's, I mean, if, you know, being at Warner's at that time, the music department was sensational head of the music department there recently passed away. He was 80 years old, but he, he was an amazing, like you just wanted music. They would go and they would get it for you. It's really great. I did have a question for you about the music because when you do movies and this was no small budget movie, you could have your own original music and you also would use music from, from pop culture. Like in the case we just described in a classic Ray Charles song to set the scene for mm. probably the core scene in the whole movie. Uh, and I, I think I had read that you had said the importance of that scene was you get to see what Chevy Chase really wanted and you start to really feel for Chevy Chase. He's not just a comedic character, but there's a purpose, at least in his mind, to this movie. But what's your approach to music when you look at a movie like this, when you decide to use songs that are established from pop culture versus original sound? You know, it's an intuitive process. It's probably intuitive for most directors anyway. Because, you you know, you're trying different things at different times. Like, for for example, there are films where you don't think about the music or the songs or the score until you're pretty well complete. Then you start to, like, focus on applying different tonalities to the movie that is kind of emerging through the process. There's other experiences where... You go, no, this is this is exactly the kind of tone, music, feeling I want and nothing else will do, whether it's score or song, because they have different impacts at different times. <laughs> you know, the choice of songs are often based on how much they cost, you know, mm -hmm. how they fit. Do they does the 
lyric interfere with dialogue? Is the lyric taking us out of the emotional truth? Or is the baggage of the music itself helping uh, expand and distill the emotive value of the scene? So all of those things come into play when selecting music. It's different for every scene. It's different for every movie. The humor in the movie was often improvisational. Can you describe a scene that you directed where improvisation kind of took over and how did that work between you and the actors when it came to improvisation? I can't say that, that, I, I mean, I have no recollection of doing anything completely improvisational on that movie. It was heavily scripted, however, with all comedy that I would participate in, and that goes for television as well. Once you kind of nail the text, and the kind of intricacies of the relationship in, in a scene, then with comedic actors, you want to let them free and let them go. And often it may just be an aside or a look or something they blurt out within the scene. It's not that, you know, you bring these actors and you go like, well, just talk about the dog. I mean, <laughs> most actors would just freeze up. Mm -hmm. But in kind of riffing off the script, it feels often more like jazz. So that, you know, you return to the root, you return to the structure of the song, in jazz case, uh, the melody, but then you can kind of go off. And depending on what your kind of fellow players are doing, it also creates a new, fresh dynamic. And so I, I don't think that, I certainly am not unique in that. This is often the way comedy mm -hmm. process would work. What scene do you remember having that happen, having that sort of unexpected thing happen when you had the two actors playing off of each other and working with you? Well, it's probably going to be in the scenes that had more of the family where there was <laughs> such a crowd that everyone was just, and by that time, everybody knew their characters pretty well so that there was the ability. I, you know, it's like Beverly grabbing Chevy's when the cops go freeze. She completely improv that. That was like happened. So, you know, I, my recollections is based on the, you know, on, on, on the little reactions, those small things, but not on the dialogue. One scene that you said was one of the most difficult was when you had the whole family sitting around the table for that dinner, that turkey dinner, and just nothing went right. I think if you ask any director, the scenes that are the most, I don't want to say frightening, but eye popping are when you have a dinner table scene. Mm -hmm. A, the complexities of eye lines and the directors listening to this will go like, oh yeah, man, oh yeah. You know, so you have four people engaged around a dinner table and you're covering all their eye lines to each other cross and, you know, so th there's a lot of technique involved. Now when you have eight people, you have 12 and 16 people. <laughs> The multiplier effect on making sure that everyone is looking and reacting in the same way, especially when everybody is talking. What, once you're established in how to cover it and what kind of coverage you want and how you're going to structure that scene, and it was a long one, and there were effects involved and all, and kids, because you can only shoot with the kids for a certain amount of time, you get rid of them. So they go to school, or they go to bed, whatever it is. So there's a lot of that kind of engagement in terms of what you need to do just to complete the scene. So, you know, just going influential on comedy at that point, you're just going with w once you've established your eye lines and your scenes, then you're running the scene and then you're back into it. Then it's about, well, is this funny? You know, uh, what beats do you want? Silence or not silence or how long the beat is or who looks where or who's saying what they should and what they shouldn't at what time, who's going to overlap dialogue, all the rest of it. So I look at it in uh, with those kinds of scenes as a very, very uh, technical exercise. And then within the technical, you start to explore the moments of each line or the dynamic of a sequence within the scene. They were long. 
Well, in addition to the lines and the scenes, the actors themselves and the characters they played have become iconic now. People not only quote the lines, but they just imagine the people saying them. The thing that you mentioned in the beginning, that little tick that, that Randy Quaid brought to that character. Uh, were there any other? How would you describe the Chevy Chase approach to the whole movie? Well, Chevy is also a great improv, you know, performer. And so he could take a line and run with it and just kind of play with it. And um, Randy was, you know, a, a different approach. You know, very, very naturally comedic instincts there as well, but in a different way. You know, you put those two guys in a room. The other favorite scene I have in the movie is the scene with both of them uh, walking around the Christmas tree. He's wearing, uh, you know, a black dickie and a white shirt. Which right. I will take complete responsibility for ordering <laughs> that up because I just thought that is funny in and of itself. Where, you know, he talks about his son barking for the yak woman or whatever it is, touching things. <laughs> all. I mean, it's, just, it's a very delicately uh, comedic scene, really. Um, you know what I mean? It, it, there's a lot of slapstick in it. It's just mm -hmm. very micro-tuned. And there's a, a, an example of, you know, it's not scripted that he's, you know, these props are falling down or, you know the little kind of verbal tics that they're using, that's not scripted. That's all them. And, you know, my job is to create an environment and uh, exploit that when I see it um, and try to kind of mute it when I feel it doesn't work. So, yeah, I, 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 I don't really have a, a kind of a, a response to improv on something as tightly structured and beautifully written as John Hughes's script. You mentioned the two of them in that one scene. I asked you about Chevy Chase. What was it like working with Randy Quaid on that film? Oh, so fun. Like, so fun. Like, 10 out of 10. Just really fun. Well, the guy loves the character, loved the character. And he just, like, he was all in. <laughs> you know, completely, 100% in. When you worked with the other cast members, you had a great ensemble cast. And some of these people were not necessarily known for their comedic background, but uh, you had so many good people. What was it like working with those veteran actors and some of the younger actors that were in that ensemble cast? Well, you know, that's an excellent question. Uh, you know, like, um, you know, E.G. Marshall, Randolph, you know, Doris, uh, you know, just on and on and on. I mean, th th these are actors who I loved their career choices throughout. And they're pretty much hired because of their dramatic chops, not their comedic chops. I wanted actors who would bring a sense of truth to the, to the scene. Actors who wouldn't shoulder the responsibility of comedy, but be able to carry the comic reactivity just based on their, I guess, their, their kind of vigilance about what feels real in a scene, you know, whether it's about talking to their son or son-in-law or daughter or showing up. And they ge gelled as well. Not to mention, you know, they were wind in my sails because I had told them, listen, this is my first film. You guys have worked with, you know, great classic directors, you know, for a sum total of, you know, 50 man years in Hollywood. And, and you know, just tell me if I'm not getting it. And they, they were just fantastic. Uh, and I had, you know, Diane Ladd, uh, you know, on and on and on. Of course, you know, on the younger side, you know, you've got Johnny Galecki, <laughs> the highest paid actor in Hollywood right now. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Juliet Lewis. I love them. I love Johnny because of his instinctive, deadpan seriousness. You know, where I know he wouldn't be like over mugging and Juliet for her, I, I, her ineffable quality, which she still carries to this day. I, I, I just think the world of her and, and she has this kind of, certainly at that point, this, this 
this kind of sullenness that I felt was so true to true to life that she didn't have to push it or or, or uh, exaggerate it, just kind of fall into that zone and let the kind of energy of you know the Randys and uh, Beverly's and the Chevys to circle and and it would work out and luckily it did. <laughs> You use the term truth, having the truth come out, and a lot of people say that the, 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 the best thing about comedy is the truth that's in the comedy. And then there's one other quote that I saw. Beverly D'Angelo said that when she decided to play Ellen Griswold, she decided that this person, when Chevy does some of these crazy things, she's going to act like this is normal because to, to, to Clark Griswold's wife, it would be normal. It wouldn't be something that would catch. So she always played it straight. You just mentioned Johnny Galecki. The scene where, where she, Johnny Galecki's character, the, Russ, is helping his father outside put the lights up. And, and it's a very quiet scene. There's not a lot of music, and it's just the two of them talking. But I just found, and I, and I watch it every year, and I, and I just always find that how almost true Johnny is acting like the son of a Clark Griswold, that this is not new to him. You could see uh, some of Clark's idiosyncrasies, and he just rolls with it. Was he directed to be like that, or did he just bring that instinctively to the character? No, I, no he, was, you know, he was heavily directed to be the adult in the room. <laughs> <laughs> It was complete, uh, you know, role reversal. You're the dad. He's the wild kid that you have to somehow control. And um, no, no, it was very, it was very directed in terms of that, you know, dynamic. Yeah. You know, he's a young actor and, you know, just getting his, I don't know how much work he did, if any, before this. There were some other actors that weren't quite in the ensemble, but they've become famous. People like Julia Louis-Dreyfus. Yeah. Brian Doyle Murray was in so many different National Lampoon <laughs> movies. And yeah! Others. <laughs> <laughs> what was it like working with them for the opportunity that you had there? Well, you know, obviously, these were like veteran actors, basically out of Saturday Night, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, and... They just felt extremely uh, tailored to the characters. In other words, uh, I don't want to say they're typecast, but they, they 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 just felt that in what I needed to achieve in those scenes, they could bring the whole thing up a notch. They would really bring it because, A, it's not like they have a whole ton of scenes so when they're in there, they're going to bring all their comedy chops. And those guys are, they're more cartoony in the script. <laughs> I wouldn't say that those characters are reality based. They're more metaphoric based of, you know, the old at that time, you know, oh, they're yuppies. But uh, <laughs> uh, so, you know, what was like working with them is just a pleasure. It was fantastic. You know, work with those actors because you know you're. It's just a breath of fresh air. You don't have days and days and days with them, so that you know they show up. They're so good, and you know they're surprising. I read a story about one of the scenes, and you had to do battle with the studio on this one. It was the it was the cat scene. Uh, so, if you could describe first off for our listeners who may not have seen the scene, what is the scene with the cat, and why did you have trouble getting that? kept in the movie uh, yeah i i don't want to exaggerate the the quote battle but it, it was rather <laughs> it was rather funny um the scene is takes place around the dinner table and we're cutting away to the tree which we have set up as being very dry and in so and it's dry later on catches on fire but meanwhile the the Cat has been chewing on the wires that are plugged in. There's a whole lot of wires. And at a certain point, it chews right through, zap, and there's a, a real fun cutaway of a splayed cat <laughs> kind of burnt into the carpet. 
you know, we all thought, and that was in the script. It was, uh, I just thought it was really, really funny. I love doing the shot of that fur <laughs> in the carpet. I just thought that was amazing. And, and I, and by the way, in, in terms of when we did uh, sound effects and ADR and, and a uh, loop, uh, I did the sound of the cat, <laughs> you know, something like <laughs> at that moment where the cat bites it. The point is that when the movie was together and we started to screen it, uh, I remember we went out to Pasadena and we were screening the movie probably for the first time. And um, the head of the studio uh, said, you know, we're really going to have to take that cat out. It's going to be too controversial, you know, blah, 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 animal cruelty, da, 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 da. As it's a comedy, nobody's gonna. First of all, it's shot like a cartoon. You're not seeing any guts. I mean, it's, it was all done in good taste. Um, bottom line, <laughs> said, let's keep it in. See what the reaction is for the first scene. And so it plays. People laugh like crazy. And uh, you know, when people laugh in a comedy, that's a good thing. But in the cards afterwards, it was hands down people's favorite scene. So. <laughs> He was in the movie. Did you ever think that the movie would be as popular now, 30 years later, as it was when you created it? I never would have thought, honestly. I, it, it was, like I said, it was an intention to try and make a, a classic movie, but maybe every director tries that with every movie they make. I, I'm pleased. <laughs> I guess that's the... You know, it's a very odd thing to be pleased about. I guess that's uh, that would be my most famous work. I, you know, it, it, it's a it's a funny thing. Uh, the movie is ne doesn't really belong to me. It belongs in the culture and the zeitgeist. I'm happy that I uh, was uh, a participant in that, and and I I so appreciate it much more now than I did then um, in terms of of the response. Because, you know, at that point, I, you know, I, I, I didn't really understand the value of comedy in, in, in our world. And maybe I was the Joel McRae character in my life on uh, <laughs> Sullivan's Travels or, you know what I mean? Where he, he learned, you know, he wants to make, oh, brother, where art thou in, in, in this movie? And, and he wants to make a socially important movie about poverty and homelessness and all the rest of it. And you know, this is what he's going to do. And he's a very famous director, sort of modeled over Sturges's career. And, and of course, he goes and he gets arrested and he's in jail and he's in a work camp and they show a comedy one night and he has an epiphany and he comes back to Hollywood as a changed man making comedies. And there's something really beautiful in that. And, and again, as a director, I, I guess... Uh, my uh, forebears as directors, we, we all felt that. And certainly when that was made, I mean, uh, you know, a, a broad comedy with Chevy Chase was not where I, you know, had imagined myself, you know, working uh, for my first film. But in retrospect, I'm very proud of it. What do you think the ingredients are for a classic now after experiencing this from as a director? Well, that's a very good question because uh, our our media diets now have been so siloed and fractured, and and um, you know now, if, if if you know if a television show, for example, gets two or three hundred thousand streamers, you know it's considered great. Uh, you know, whereas, you know, even as close as five years ago, if you had a million people watching a show is a complete disaster. So, you know, our 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 appetites outside of kind of the big event, Marvel movies, etc., I, I, I think are they haven't allowed us to come together with the big event. I mean, there are exceptions that prove the rule like this week, you know jokers in the theater and that's a big movie and there's a lot of conversation about it and so maybe that's a classic i i believe it's a classic you know in 50 years people look at it and go wow that movie is a sign of our times now very very bleak look at the country so i uh, i i think that that you can't 
expect the responses to film in general to be the same as they were, not in the streaming universe, not in our marketing universes, and with the competition for eyeballs and wallets and ears with so much choices we make, it's very hard to predict what's going to be a classic. I mean, today, if we were going to pick, say, a television show, we'd go, well, Fleabag will be a classic. But, you know, how many people will have seen it outside of On the Coasts and those who are really interested in it? I don't know. I think it's hard to predict. I think you just have to go with the work, make the work, do the best, and let history take care of the rest. When someone watches National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation this year, what would you hope it does for them? I hope it gives them a good laugh. (laughs) (laughs) That would be a start. That's it. I I think that, that, you know, I, I do see the studios making less comedies certainly making less what i would say constructed stories that are comedic you know they want big brash bold action comedies of which you know there are good and there are bad but you know there are not many like john hughes who was able to tap into kind of a resonant resonant kind of values of you know, how people relate to each other, whether it's family or friends or kind of similarities, uh, and do it in a kind of um, observable, comedic way. I mean, there is that. Uh, most of it has moved to television. I do think that that we are also now in very dark times, and of course we need comedy, but what is the root of great comedy now? Obviously, it's tragedy. They're the flip of each other. And I expect as things kind of move along, we will end up with funnier and funnier movies, but in unexpected ways. Jeremiah Chechik, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. It was enjoyable. To learn more about Jeremiah Chechuk and some of the additional stories behind National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation, please see our show notes at shapingopinion.com. If you enjoyed this episode, please let people know by leaving a rating and review in Apple Podcasts. You can subscribe to the Shaping Opinion Podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. We'd love to hear from you on Twitter. Just tweet to us at Shaping Opinion, or you can get in touch with us through our website, shapingopinion.com. We have a Facebook page, and we're on Instagram at Shaping Opinion. Shaping Opinion is a production of O'Brien Communications. This is where we talk about people, events, and things that have shaped the way we think. Until next time, I'm Tim O'Brien.